first off, I mean, with insulin resistance in the first place, it's nebulous territory because people want to kind of pick it apart as like, okay, well, we can't really talk about reducing insulin. We can't do because insulin is important and we need it and yada, yada. But when you look at the fact that, you know, like 40% of adults are, at least 40% of adults are insulin resistant. So that's, that tells us there's a lot going on. There's probably a larger number than that. And it is something, so in a healthy individual, like insulin management. It's really fun to have you on my podcast. I have to say, even though YouTube is kind of both of our big platforms, it's really fun to have you here in a podcast setting. So thank you for joining me. You bet. So here's what I think would be really helpful for people is I really want to dive into the nuance of insulin. So one thing that I feel like is the world understands that insulin resistance causes diabetes, type two diabetes. Um, we also know when I can't lose weight, I must be insulin resistant. But outside of that, or maybe I know if I go to my doctor's office and my hemoglobin A1C is high, outside of that, I feel like we're insulin resistant illiterate. Like we don't understand what exactly it is. So can you talk about what some of the signs are? Let's start there. How would I know that I'm insulin resistant outside of those things that I just mentioned? Yeah. I, well, first off, I mean, with insulin resistance in the first place, it's nebulous territory because people want to kind of pick it apart as like, okay, well, we can't really talk about reducing insulin. We can't do because insulin is important and we need it and yada, yada. But when you look at the fact that, you know, like 40% of adults are at least 40% of adults are insulin resistant. So that's, that tells us there's a lot going on. There's probably a larger number than that. And it is something. So in a healthy individual, like insulin management isn't as important of a thing, but the problem is that the lion's share of people are not healthy individuals. So it right. does become very important. Um, and yeah, people think insulin resistance, they go, okay, well, I just have to measure my glucose and then just have to look at that. And even that can give you really skewed results because that's not, you're not measuring your insulin, right? We like, you might, you might eat some carbohydrates, you might eat some potatoes and then measure your glucose and your glucose goes to 160 and 180. And you think you're insulin resistant when in reality, if you were to measure two hours later and everything went back down, your body essentially did what it's supposed to do, right? right. So it's not just, a, and that's where people think, okay, insulin resistance and high blood glucose, although they do go hand in hand, they're not the same thing. They're not the exact same thing. And one of the first ones that I want to talk about specifically is like, is extreme hunger. Like it just yes. flat out. Like if you wake up in the morning and you are really, really hungry, I mean, it is a very simple thing that, your body is neglecting fuel. It's not, or it's avoiding fuel because it can't receive the fuel, right? Yep. So it makes sense that you would be very, very hungry. And there's really just interesting research about how insulin plays a role with the brain. And I talked about this recently in a video, so it's very fresh in my mind. Uh, there was a study where they gave subjects uh, intranasal insulin. And if you oh, give wow. someone intranasal insulin, it can cross the blood-brain barrier pretty quick and they can do that stuff. So they gave half the subjects a placebo, half the subjects intranasal insulin, and then they did an fMRI scan where they looked at their brain activity. And they found that the subjects that received insulin, that the insulin actually traveled to the brain, they ended up having better connectivity between the brain and the body and ultimately ended up having a better connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampal region. And essentially what that is saying is that if insulin actually gets where it's supposed to go and gets to the brain and gets into the cells in the brain, it can actually impact in a very positive way our satiety and how we actually crave food. But when we are insulin resistant, it goes beyond just what's happening in the periphery, like where our cells aren't getting nutrients. It literally, like if the insulin is not reaching its target properly and we're not even getting insulin in the brain, we could argue that we're, it's altering our satiety cues. And especially in the morning, because most people are, you know, they haven't been eating all night. So they're already waking up, they're in a fasted state, and they're going to be more hungry. So it just makes sense that that would be exacerbated in someone that's insulin resistant. And it's such a simple thing that, you know, it gets often overlooked. So do, are you saying then, and this is a key point, that I could love the number on the scale, I could be the thinnest person in the world. But if I'm hungry all day. I can't go without food. That could be the beginning signs of insulin resistance. In a lot of ways, yes. Yeah, because it's, you know, weight is not always a direct reflection, right? Whether you're underweight or overweight. 
I don't want to say that, you know, being overweight is healthy, but there are people that are overweight that are not insulin resistant, right? Like adipose tissue in and of itself is sort of a master regulator of a lot of things and has its own set of problems, but it doesn't necessarily constitute an insulin resistance issue and vice versa, right? Like if, so if you're, but if you're also satiated or you're, you're not that hungry all the time, like sometimes that can be a late stage insulin resistance issue. And the reason that I mentioned that is that imagine this, imagine you have gone so long with your body not recognizing glucose very well. Okay. And this has happened for years and it went unrecognized. Well, to, at a certain point, your body has no choice, but to upregulate fatty acid oxidation. Mm -hmm. It has no choice because it's been deprived of fuel. So in an advanced stage of insulin resistance, kind of moving towards diabetes, this happens. Like you can actually see where in diabetes, like a lot of times they actually increase the rate of fat oxidation because their body is forced to have to use another substrate. So wow. the reason I mentioned that is like that, that can arguably be good for people with weight, you know, for weight loss, but it's not exactly the way you want to go for it. Right. It's not, right. you don't want to, I want to become diabetic so that my body oxidizes fat. That's not the goal. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing. So usually when you start feeling the lack of hunger, a lot of times you notice that happen with like a type one diabetic where it's a very extreme situation, right? Where they're, uh, no insulin, they need artificial insulin or exogenous insulin and they get to a point, but they don't know it yet. Right. It's like, I have a, a family member that didn't realize they were type one diabetic until they're in their mid twenties and yeah, couldn't put on weight. Right. It was like the body is neglecting glucose. So it's one of those things to really pay attention to. Yeah. And we're back at that conversation of like, the, it's the balance, right? And we, we've yep. made health black and white. You know, when this number shows up on your cholesterol, you're healthy. When this number shows up on hemoglobin A1C, you're diabetic. Like we make it too linear. But what I hear you saying is, too much hunger, not enough hunger, you're now tipping the scales where you may be in insulin resistance land. Exactly, exactly. And it's, it's, you know, you, it's a very fine line, right? But it's yeah. a, I always say it's a, it's a fine line, but it's a very bold line at the same time. It's like, once you cross that line, it's, uh, you know, it's very hard to get back. Yeah. And you know, another thing that happens that we don't always think about is greasy skin. Okay. Mm. Now there's a lot of evidence that suggests that like kind of the, the patchy weird red skin that you see in people that are diabetic, that makes a lot of sense. But what about like earlier stages like in the morning, okay, we all have woken up where we felt like our skin is greasy or oily. And sometimes we can equate it to certain things. But if it starts becoming something that's happening every day, and you're an adult, and you're starting to get like greasy skin and acne. One of the things we have to look at is that when insulin is high, like it's not actually it's being produced, but it's circulating, you have high circulating insulin, insulin is actually going to promote the production of androgens. Okay. So, mm. and androgens alone are going to make you make your skin greasy, things like that. I want you to think, you know, think of a kid that is going through puberty, a 12 year old boy or a 13 year old boy, all of a sudden his skin's getting greasy and he's got an acne popping up everywhere. Then his hormones are raging, right? Okay. Well, insulin, when it's in its normal values, when it's spiking, it can be a very positive anabolic thing, right? There's a reason why in the bodybuilding community, they want insulin to be spiked for a certain level, right? In fact, even in the extreme bodybuilding cases, people will literally take exogenous insulin. They will use insulin to try to grow muscle. Right. Not a healthy thing to do. Don't recommend it. Yes. But the point is that it will grow muscle because it's very anabolic and it will also stimulate androgen production. But you don't want this happening, <laughs> A, if you're not a bodybuilder, B, if you are just a regular person trying to live your life and it could be a very clear indicator. So what ends up happening as far as the greasy skin is concerned is it ends up becoming just a result of those androgens. But additionally, when IGF is also elevated as a result of insulin, so IGF is insulin-like growth factor. When IGF gets elevated, this is a very pro-growth thing, which can be good for recovery. But as we get older, it's not necessarily something we want circulating at high levels. That happens, but additionally, what has been demonstrated to happen is with hyperinsulinemia, you also end up having a decrease in the IGF binding protein. So you have higher levels of circulating IGF with less places for that IGF to go. Now, when this happens, it sort of deforms and throws a wrench in sort of the proliferation and the apoptosis of various keratinocytes, so the skin cells. And when that happens, you have skin cells that are dying when they shouldn't die, skin cells that are growing when they shouldn't grow, and you have this imbalance, and that itself is going to lead to greasy skin and acne and clogged pores. Yeah. So it's 
it's, it's wild, but you wouldn't associate greasy skin with that. But if you start noticing it happening, it doesn't mean you're insulin resistant, but it means like, you know what, these things are starting to stack up. I should probably look deeper into this and do like a HOMA IR test and really figure this out. So interesting. So, okay. If you take this 17 year old boy, who's got packed with acne, is there an insulin resistant part to that? No, because that's usually going to be, well, that's a good question. I don't know entirely, right? I'm sure there is probably some links to that because when you look at, you know, younger individuals, like and what they're eating these days, I'm sure there is some link to that, right? I could yeah. probably, but correlation doesn't equal causation. So I can't say with certainty, but usually like you're having just big pulses of androgenic compounds and essentially big pulses of testosterone and other androgens. So with that, it's a direct correlation, less so with the insulin. I would imagine, however, that if a kid is insulin resistant and they are also going through puberty, it would make sense in theory that it would exacerbate that issue and possibly yeah. make acne worse, right? So it's uh, it's a strong theory that probably st stands up. You know, uh, my son, he turns 20 next week and he's barely had a pimple on his face his whole life. And I've tried to figure out what it is. Like, why is that? I mean, he's eaten obviously really clean in our home, but I, I, he's not, he doesn't eat clean outside of my home. Yeah. So, uh, so it's just an interesting, I'd never really thought of that correlation. And then we do know that like PCOS, so women who have PCOS that now start to get hair on their face, that there's yeah. an insulin resistant piece to that. So could yeah. we flip it and even say the 30, you know, the 30 year old woman who maybe it wasn't diagnosed with PCOS, but all of a sudden knows, notices when she goes in to get her eyebrows done that she needs to maybe get her mustache done. Yeah. Uh, is, is that a potential sign of the beginnings of insulin resistance? So it's, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, I, I filmed some content surrounding this whole topic not that long ago, which is why it's probably so even the studies are fresh in my mind. And in the day that I filmed this, I went to the grocery store and I, this is, no offense to the lady, I saw a woman with a full fledged beard, right? Yeah. And like a full fledged like goatee. And I'm sure she's a nice person. And I, I, but it, it was like, I looked at her and I'm like, wow. wow, thinking about what I just talked about, I tried to connect that dot too, right? Now, not necessarily with PCOS, she was an older woman, but I'm like, there clearly is some androgenic issue going on there where she's producing male hormones to a certain degree. Right. At her age, she was an older person, probably in her 60s. There could be a number of different cattywampus hormone things that are the result of that. But it did get me thinking about just this very thing. And like with PCOS, it's such a strong interplay between the hormones and insulin resistance it would make sense that you also see, you know, with PCOS, you see these instances of patchy little facial hair, things like that. It does add up, right? Because they're somewhere along the line, these hormones are getting skewed. And again, if insulin resistance is the cause of it, that would make sense because there's so many other things that add up. Again, we can't say with 100% certainty, obviously, but we do have to look at all these different correlative pieces and sort of generate our own hypothesis with this. And especially when it's something that's so easy to potentially course correct, Yeah. then I, I feel comfortable saying that. Yeah. And I think what all, what we also need are indicators like the symptoms we're talking about, because, you know, people are stepping into their, their doctor's office maybe once a year and getting this, this blood evaluation. If they don't, if their hemoglobin A1C, their fasting insulin, fasting glucose is off, there's going to be a recommendation and then they're not going to get checked for another year. So we need more of this stuff. What, what do you think of like eyesight? So we have the most amount of mitochondria in our eyes and we know that diabetics, that's one thing that happens when they become insulin resistant. Could we look at changes in eyesight, uh, uh, light sensitivity, uh, things like that as signs of insulin, beginning insulin resistance? I, I strongly believe that you could. Uh, and there was some data that kind of looked at this where it was like, uh, I can't remember the actual specifics of it, but essentially it's like, okay, if you took a look at people that were diabetic versus insulin resistant and they kind of measured the blurred vision and they measured kind of the issues with the eyes in general, uh, it wasn't really that detectable of a difference. But then when they actually dug deeper and they sort of retroactively like kind of algorithmically look at the data, they're just like, okay, wait a minute. We could actually recognize that there are signs of insulin resistance as far as their vision is concerned that is not necessarily detectable through their eyesight, but by looking at actual data and looking at like the eye itself. Now with that, 
I do think as far as light sensitivity and things like that are concerned, like if I go and I have a bunch of sugar, which isn't very often, and I go and I walk outside, I feel like I have a hard time even adjusting to the light. I feel like everything is messed up, everything is out of whack. And it does make sense, right? Like if even from a, just a, a very acute standpoint, I think a like super high spike, acute spike in glucose for a period of time probably does impact eyesight, right? Like those capillaries are very easy to kind of jack up.